now we go to someone who is one of my personal heroes. It's not just that she's probably one of the best, greatest equine surgeons in the world, but in 2006, she testified before Congress in favor of the American Horse Slaughter Prevention Act, which wouldn't be unusual except that the organization that she was connected with, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, was opposed to it. And so Patty Hogan went out on a limb, and at the time it was sort of revolutionary because she was one of the first to do it, someone of her caliber to do it. And so it is my tremendous honor to have this incredible person, a wonderful vet, grace us with her presence today and speak to you about racing, a sport that she loves and wants to see fixed. And um, Patty. Good morning, and very happy to be here. It's, um, I've learned so much already, and there's so many people that I'd really like to meet that I've heard about, but it's, it's really nice that we're all in the same room and trying to find resolution to this problem that affects all of us, and um, I'm just happy to be able to contribute something. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a reluctant participant in this fight. I am not a political person. No offense to the politicians here, but it's just not my style. I'm just, you know, veterinarian, like my life, taking care of horses. That's what I've done, you know, since I was a little girl, just been with horses. But it just, things happened that kind of made me come out to uh, be a voice. And it was not something that I had planned on doing, but it was something that happened and actually something I don't regret. But it has changed my life in many ways, and I'll, I'll explain. But I'm going to talk to you um, really about what I know about, and that is I'm a veterinarian and I'm involved in the racing community. And as you know, there's been a lot of issues with racing as far as um, scandals and establishing relevance in today's society, and slaughter is part of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how racing is affected by this relationship. So that the title of my talk is Why Slaughter and Racing Are Wrong for Each Other. And it, it's it's really a two-way street. I will show you through the talk, I don't know why slaughter, the slaughter industry would want anything to do with racehorses. Um, it just, it's bad business for them. And certainly for racing, it's obvious. But for the slaughter industry, I think they should take a look at it in that regard. So this, let me tell you a little bit about why I'm here. And really, it boils down to two things. I'm a veterinarian. I care about horses. I've just loved horses my whole life. Since I was 10 years old, I've worked with race horses. It's just who I am. That's one reason. The other is that I'm actually a business owner involved in the racing community. So those two things together give me a reason to speak out about this subject. I work in New Jersey. I have a clinical practice, um, specialized in surgery. I basically work 99% of my caseload is race horses, standard bred and thoroughbred race horses. As a business owner, I'm in a great location. I'm in central Jersey. There's 17 racetracks within a four-hour drive of my clinic. I see lots of racehorses. We see about 2,000 horses a year. And I'm lucky enough that we're in a location that many of the horses we see are the elite racing athletes. So these horses are treated well. They're expensive. They're worth something to the person that has them. The sad part for me has been when I see those same horses years later, worth very little to the person that has them then. Mm -hmm. That really began to affect me as I went through my career. So, how I ended up in this <coughs> arena was, in 2006, I got a call from Congressman Ed Whitfield that asked me if I would testify um, in support of the Horse Slaughter Prevention Act, H.R. 503. I didn't know anything about the slaughter industry at the time. It was, I was just living in a bubble. I really, really didn't know. I knew that that sort of existed, but I just really didn't have a handle on it. And this really opened my eyes. What, the reason why they asked me to speak was at the um, presentation before Congress, you are given the opportunity, pro and con. Three people are representing each side. So for the people that were represented on the pro-slaughter side, side was the slaughterhouse operator, 
and two veterinarians. So Congressman Whitfield was at a loss as to not having a veterinary voice on the con side to support the bill. So that's why I got involved, and I think really he just picked me because I happened to have some uh, media exposure because I worked on a horse named Smarty Jones who had won the Kentucky Derby. So mm -hmm. I think that's why it ended up that way, but it was fortuitous. Mm -hmm. So I went there as a representative to support the bill as a veterinarian. So I testified before Congress, and I have to tell you it was an eye-opening experience in a negative way. Mm -hmm. I was surprised at what was said on the, the uh, negative side, on the con side, against the bill. I thought I was a pretty good member of my profession and upstanding individual, and I was a member of the AVMA and the AEP, and I, I just really thought as veterinarians, this is what we do. We take care of horses, we look out for their welfare. Um, you know, it was intuitively obvious to me. Yet when I testified, the three points that I went over were, number one, the in inhumanities that occurred to the horses and their, their travel through this pipeline and slaughter industry. And why that occurs is, is basically because that industry is a scavenging type of industry. There's no profit really to be made. It's a small profit margin. Nobody cares what the market weight is of a horse when it goes to the slaughterhouse. They don't care to take care of it. They don't care to feed it well. It's just basically picking up some garbage off the street and passing it down the road. So as a result, nobody takes care of them very well. And so the, the in inhumanities that occurred were just unacceptable to me as a veterinarian. And then as a member of the racing com community, the public perception issues that affected uh, the racing industry really upset me. Most of uh, the negative press concerning many of the horses that were slaughtered revolved around race horses because they were easily identifiable. And the third thing, which I think is now we realize is our ace in the hole, is the drug residue and food safety issue. Part of my veterinary oath involves food safety and public health. And so I thought it was pretty obvious that you know, there was a tremendous amount of issues with drug residues, and this was in 2006 that we were talking about this. So those were my three points, yet on the other side of the coin, the other table, were the president of the AAP and um, I think the vice president of the AVMA. <coughs> no one touched on food safety at all. And when I brought it up, it was discarded. The question was not even answered. So that was very puzzling to me and also very disappointing. So that was an eye-opener for me, and after that happened, of course, the bill stalled with the political process, but it bothered me, and I, I didn't stop. So I'm still involved, and um, it did change, <laughs> did change the way I felt a little bit about my profession. I sort of retreated privately, uh, you know, as far as that goes, but I think it'll come around eventually. So why are we fascinated with the horse? What is it about the horse that America is in love with? I mean, horses have, are so storied in our history. They've settled our land. They've built our buildings and bridges and canals, as we've heard this morning. Um, they're beautiful animals. Uh, there was a poll in 1980 that was done uh, asking Americans what their favorite animals were, and number three was the horse. I, I'm sure you know what one and two was, but <laughs> you know, number three was the horse. So people really love horses. There's just something about them that separates them from the classic food animal producing species that we know. I'm very drawn to the strength and athleticism, obviously, because I work with racehorses, but there's just so much that they can do. We've all seen the amazing um, strength, speed, endurance that horses are capable of and the versatility of which they do it. But I think that what the average American is most drawn to is the partnership that we observe with man and horse. Um, the gentleman on your left here, this is a, you can see my printer, but the first picture on the left that's a Roger Hammer, and the horse that he's kissing, and he's not an affectionate guy at all. <laughs> uh, he's a crotchety old man, but that horse is vivid photo, and he just won the Hamiltonian, and that's a horse that he raised and bred, and, and he still has him. I, I think he raced him till he was six or seven, Ellen, and he's kept him, of course, but he drove the horse himself, and that's a million dollar race, and of course, he's going to kiss him. <laughs> so it's just, you don't see people doing that with your favorite swine or you know, your 
chicken. So it's you know it's very um, it's very touching to the average person. And the person on the right is one of my former professors. That's Dr. Dean Richardson, and that horse is Barbaro. Dean is a very mean person. Um, I was scared of him tremendously as a student, but. He was brought to tears by that horse. He did everything he could to save him, and he's a brilliant man. But when he lost the horse, it affected him deeply, and it's something I think he carries with him for the rest of his life. But why is that? There's something about the horse that people are drawn to. And again, we have uh, the horse on the bottom left is an off-the-track thoroughbred, and the joy that you see with the, with the rider is the horse just completed a difficult course, it's a partnership that's very fulfilling to both. The last horse on the right is a very famous horse in the last year or two. His name is Frankel, mm -hmm. and he was a, a tremendous European star and very loved by the public. So if you take these pictures and see how people feel about horses, it really doesn't make sense that they would be part of the slaughter or, or food chain. It just seems intuitively obvious that they don't go together. So the role of, of the horse has definitely changed in society. This is something that we need to be aware of, and this is something that I feel um, maybe some of the people fighting the bills have not really become aware of very well. Um, an agrarian society is one that's dependent upon agriculture. That's how we started this country. Um, we now see that that has changed quite a bit. And so the people that are growing up now in um, used to be rural settings are more suburban, more urban settings. So we see a general reduction in rural settings, so the average American is not exposed to agriculture like maybe 20 or 30 years ago. The horse is classified right now as livestock, and with that comes a lot of um, political issues as far as funding, research dollars, etc. But in the people's mind, they've become more and more a companion animal. So where does he fit now? Of course, years ago, the horse was a valuable part of anyone's family to survive. Now they've become companions. Where do they fit in? So the role of the horse today, I, I'm one of those people that feels that a horse deserves a job. That might be racing or pulling a cart or jumping or somebody's companion. Even a pasture animal is a job for that person but they need to have some purpose, something to do, some status. We see them do many things for us still to this day, urban law enforcement. I work a lot with standard breads. They make tremendous police horses. They're, they're bomb proof. Um, the Ellen Harvey is here from the U.S. Charting Association, and we've done a lot to get some of these horses placed with the police department. They absolutely love them. Border Patrol, we've seen that accessing places that we normally cannot really get to. And of course, the usual pleasure in sport. So they still have tremendous roles in society. It's just changed. Racing in the U.S. today, um, believe it or not, there's about 35,000 thoroughbred race races that are held every year, which is probably too many. But more than 50 tracks still exist in the U.S. We are actually third in the world in the most money bet. Uh, I think Japan and can't remember the other country that's ahead of us. Ahead of us. So $10.7 billion, that's a lot of money, a lot of taxes. They have a crucial far-reaching impact. Not just jobs, primary jobs, meaning, um, say, the person that's training the horse, or the grooms, or, or the truck drivers, but myself, a veterinarian, the food supplier, uh, you know, feed store, the person that grows the hay and straw. Um, Tolls. I, I mean, I have. I'm within four hours. There's 17 tracks. Those people come up and down the New Jersey Turnpike and pay tolls to take horses to my clinic or to the racetrack or anywhere else. So there's a tremendous secondary and tertiary job involvement. Small business support. Open space. New Jersey, where I'm from, has three racetracks that are struggling right now. But thanks to the racetracks, we have tremendous open space in New Jersey. Where my clinic is, we have a five-mile radius of just farms. That's breeding farms. Without racing, I, I don't know what they would be. I guess they would have trees on them. But they're, they have horses right now, and I think that's important. Tax revenue, of course, and then there's just numerous other examples of what racing contributes economically. There's a real crisis in Ontario right now with um, the racing industry, and people are finding out just how valuable the uh, 
economic uh, contribution is of racing, people are losing their jobs and secondary and ter tertiary jobs as well. So racing, unfortunately, has been struggling for relevance in the U.S., um, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, in the 1930s, it was the um, only legalized opportunity for gambling. And that sort of happened, many industries were struggling for revenue, but racing could kind of say it was a sport, so it was able to kind of get in there and not be considered unsavory. Uh, so that's why it happened in the 30s, but um, late, late 20s, early 30s. But since then, we now have many other opportunities for gambling, and particularly the emergence of the racinos. A racino, of course, is a, a casino attached to a racetrack, and the attachment is largely because of laws that had put into place dictating where gambling could occur. But what we're seeing now in the racing industry is that the casinos have gotten their foot in the door and now they're sort of distancing themselves from racing. So there's another set of challenges as far as revenue with racing. Mm. Also the customer demographic has changed. So it used to be those old guys with the pants hanging down and you know, kind of smelly that you would see in an OTB parlor. That was the typical race tracker and that's not really so anymore. They're sort of dying off and uh, the younger crowds, although you're getting some new um, fans, not at the rate at which you're losing them. So an interesting to statistic was the Jockey Club round table saying that uh, thoroughbred racing is losing fans at a rate of 4% a year. That's actually very big when you add up 10 and 20 years. The other thing that, that's uh, hard for people is the way you have to gamble. You, you have to think, actually, to gamble on a race. So it's difficult for somebody that can easily go up and pull a slot machine to then have to sit down and learn how to handicap and read a daily racing form, which you know was extremely hard for even a, a savvy person to read. So there's some issues with that. One thing that's happening is uh, racing is, strugg uh, is struggling also because it's evolving back to more of a sport. It is really part of the entertainment industry. And in doing so, it competes with many other entertainment, forms of entertainment, for the dollar. Um, we have seen that some of our marquee events are gaining popularity, like the Kentucky Derby. Pretty much everyone knows who wins the Derby every year for a week or so, and just like the Super Bowl. And um, the ratings have been increasing as far as that goes. The handle is up on the quality races, but the bread and butter of the racing industry has is, is been in decline, and that's the everyday racing night after night. So the business as usual, as usual model is not attractive to this new demographic. Mm -hmm. And part of that, to me, is the welfare issue. Um, and also that they just don't really understand agriculture, they're not part of that society, they don't really, you know, can't really jive with it. So, who is the emerging fan? It's not that guy. So that's the old guy <laughs> that we used to see that would sit there and spend all afternoon reading the daily racing form. So the traditional fan now is very tech savvy. They've got smartphones, iPads, tablets, they want something right now. They want to figure it out in two seconds or less. Mm -hmm. um, there's many opportunities for entertainment. This is a NAS oops, sorry. This is a NASCAR race. Look at the crowd. Mm -hmm. And that's I don't understand that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's there. So I, it's, they're very popular. But that is who's out there now for that same entertainment dollar. That's the kind of crowd and we just are not attracting them at the rate that we should be in order to survive. The other issues I was talking about with the animal welfare, you've probably all heard about them. There's many things going on right now with animal welfare and racing. Breakdown injuries, it was quite an expose with the New York Times last year. Um, and some of that has resulted in some positive changes for racing. But nonetheless, they're there and they have contributed to a negative impression of the general public as to how racehorses are treated. Drug use, of course, that's a big issue. Um, anytime you're racing for money, whether it's cars or horses or anything else, there's going to be the opportunity for cheating and for drug use. The aftercare is a big deal. For years, nobody knew what happened to, to thoroughbred racehorses or standard racehorses when they were done racing. 
can't really hide that anymore. So aftercare has come to the fore forefront, and rightfully so. And slaughter goes hand in hand with that. Slaughter of racehorses is a big part of this concern and interrelated. I think this is a really important point that I feel has been missed by, I'll say, some of the um, leaders of my profession. Anthropomorphism, that is a big word, but what it really means is people applying human characteristics to animals. So looking at your dog and saying, my dog is happy right now, or it's smiling at me, or it's looking at me with love, you know, things like that. As much as you as a scientist may say, well, that just doesn't exist, you need to recognize that's how people feel. And that's become a big issue when people are looking at racing. Horses shouldn't be whipped. They don't like the whip to be whipped. They, it's cruel, things like that. That's just an example. That has changed laws about whipping, and that's a good thing. But you have to understand your customer. You have to understand that's how the general public feels. It's not how the old hard boot race trackers might feel or some of the livestock people that we've dealt with with, these, with the bills. It's, it's just you have to know your customer. So for racing, that's how people feel. If you don't recognize that, I don't think you'll get to point B. This is a big thing. I think the internet has really changed a lot of what's happened with racing because, like I said, we never used to know where horses went. Even myself, going through school and starting early in my career, I just, it wasn't something I really thought about. Now it's in your face. We all know the stories of horses found at auctions, and thoroughbreds are easy targets because they have tattoos. Mm -hmm. So you can find a trail. So Facebook, you know, Twitter, There'll be a picture in, at, the, at the auction, an instant picture sent on Facebook to thousands of people. That has resulted in, in the end, very good, good things have happened, but it's been in a real ex expose, I'd say, on what really happens to these horses after they're done. You can't really hide that anymore. It's been a very, very powerful effect. Um, there is some positivity about that. Look at some of the, the names that people know about now. Zenyatta. You know, it was an incredible, wonderful racehorse. A great story all the way around. And the general public was well aware of it. Barbara, of course, the struggles of his um, injury and you know how dedicated his, the uh, medical teams and his owners were to, to making him survive. Um, also, it's provided some real-time access to racing. It's been a positive in that regard. There's some trainers who are very up on things. They have Twitter accounts telling fans what their horses are doing, how they're doing, when they're racing again. So it's been very, very positive, but it's been very negative in some regards. You cannot really hide things anymore that used to be hidden, and everything is instant, and everyone has a comment about it. So there's, there's blogs, and you read some very you know, harsh things about, about what's out there, but it's the truth, so I'm all for it. Just, let's just expose it and move on, but let's make changes. If I was an average person, I would say, you look at this, these two pictures. This is what you know, the average person in the racetrack would come for entertainment. Look at these two horses and you say, what's the difference between these two horses? They're both three-year-old colts. They both are very attractive. They're well-mannered, well-behaved, no behavioral issues whatsoever. They're both owned and trained by very reputable connections. They get the best hay, best feed. They live, live great life. They both won multiple stake races, and they won lots of money, over $600,000. The difference is, the one on the top is alive, and the one on the bottom went to slaughter. Mm -hmm. oh. The only reason why is the one on the top is Smarty Jones. So he had some stallion value. He was famous. The one on the bottom, despite the fact that he made that much money, he was sent to slaughter. That's just the way it went, and there's something wrong with that picture, because the average person, they don't understand that. How can that horse do well and still end up in a terrible place? So it just doesn't make sense, and it turns people off. Another thing about racing is we name horses. You get to know them. There's fan clubs. You know, there's highlights, there's documentaries, there's profiles done, there's great press. 
it, you can't really have it both ways. This is my, my suggestion to racing. You can't have it both ways. If you want the public to fall in love with your participants, mm -hmm. then you need to do something to take care of them afterwards. You, you just can't seize the moment and then forget the responsibility. So it's not like we, they have numbers on them and no one ever knows them. We encourage that. You know, the people are encouraged to follow the horses and to get to know them. And they, they write, if you ever read some of the articles about these horses, the tendency is to write about their personality. The one is quirky, playful, whatever. You don't really read that about a cow or you know any, anything in the food chain. It just doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing that's real important is the greyhound racing industry. If anyone's familiar with that, that used to be a pretty thriving industry. It's no longer. It's very few. I think there's the one one track in Florida left. We're, we're, we're working on. Are oh, you working on it? <laughs> <laughs> I've been to it, um, but it used to be a tremendous track in I think New Hampshire. It was over 100 years old, and I'm pretty sure it was closed in the last couple of years. Be and really because of public perception issues leading to animal rights abuses and, and welfare issues. And that's, that was really the number one driving force behind the demise of the greyhound racing industry in the Northeast. If we can't learn from that, we're really in trouble. Um, it's the same concepts. I think it's important to know your enemies, and I say revealers. I, I'm not a part of any animal rights group. I, I don't really even know what an animal rights activist is. I just I probably didn't call that, but I don't really know what it is. But you need to know your, your revealers. So PETA I put down as a, an example. But there are people that are watching you, watching us. And you need to be accountable for what you're doing. So if you don't recognize that as an issue, you're way behind the eight ball. This is what I just don't get. 80% of Americans, I think it might be 85 in some of the polls, are against slaughter of horses. I mean, it's, just, it's a no-brainer to me. I just do not understand why racing has had difficulty coming out and saying, we don't support it. Do we really want the other 20%? Is that what we're looking for, for our demographic? I mean, it's just really uh, is a puzzle to me. Racing is an entertainment industry. It just makes no sense whatsoever that you can solicit an entertainment dollar from the public and yet tell them that your participants are out the door. You know, just you don't care about them. They're going to slaughter once you're done. I just don't don't see that as a real practice builder for your your organization. So positive image to me is really essential. To see commercials like this right before the Derby is happening is not helpful to giving a positive image to racing. There's a lot of quotes that are um, thrown about, and I did do a lot of research in this because I did write an editorial that quoted this same fact, but it's pretty close to 50% of the thoroughbred crop in the last few years has been essentially going to slaughter. That's a, a terrible statistic, and it's a real um, eye-catcher when people see that. Something has to be done about that. And remember that word that I told you about, that terrible long word, anthropomorphism. People do feel that way. They think that way. So a horse that finishes last <coughs> gets punished or is sent to the slaughterhouse. I mean, that just that's how people equate that, is that you don't respect the effort. You just disregard the poor performance, and the horse is gone. So you see this ad on the right, that's very typical, and that's appealing to the general public. They read something like that and think, how could that be? How could that horse make money for somebody and be thrown away? It just really does not make sense at all. This is the bottom part, the slaughter versus processing. I really have a beef with this. I don't mean to, there's no pun there intended, but... <laughs> <laughs> Just call it what it is. Uh, a couple years ago, the word processing started to come up, and I, I think it started with my organization, uh, AEP. They decided to change the term to horse processing, I guess, to sort of soften mm -hmm. what it really was. But it, it's insulting, actually, to people who, who already know what's happening. Just call it what it is. It's, I think it's very disingenuous. It's horse slaughter. These horses aren't processed. 
These horses are somebody's pet, somebody's companion, someone's racehorse, someone's carriage horse, somebody's work animal, somebody's anything, anything a horse does. One, one's or, one or another will end up in a slaughterhouse. They're not somebody's foal that was raised, you know, to be market weight and, you know, handled with uh, the idea that they would get the best price for their, their price per pound. It's not that at all. It's, this is the garbage can. These are the pieces of garbage that are picked up and thrown out. So I take real offense to that <coughs> sudden ter term uh, processing. This, like I said, I think is your ace in the hole, and it ended up, we all sort of concentrated on the humanities issue initially because it was the most offensive to us. But if you really want to get through the political process and get things done, it looks like this is really um, the most compelling argument. There is an issue with drug residues. I used to work with cattle when I was learning to be a veterinarian. <coughs> There was ex extremely strict guidelines about what you could use on a, on a cow if it was going to slaughter. In fact, there were some cases where we couldn't treat the animal because it was too sick and it would need drugs that would not be allowed through the slaughter pipeline. So the horse, was, or sorry, the, the cow was sent to slaughter instead of being treated. Mm -hmm. So there's very, very strict guidelines about, about for prohibited drugs and specific withdrawal times. There's just no way that a racehorse has not received phenylbutazone. And that's the drug that's gotten the most publicity. It's uh, an easy tag and very common. We know that every horse gets bute, uh, ra every racehorse. But the more interesting thing to me is, what about all the illegal drugs that we do know have, exist and are given to horses for racing purposes? This, there's drugs I don't even know the names of. But just imagine, just a couple of them. There's one called Dermorphin, the frog juice drug that was the big scandal a year or two ago. What does the public think of that? It's a, it's a toxin that's produced by frogs and used to give to horses so that they can not feel pain. It's 40 times more potent than morphine. What if there was a test for that and, that, and people found out that was in their meat? The compounded clenbuterols, which is a prohibited drug in food animals, there's so many drugs that we don't even know. Just imagine the scandal that would occur if that was uh, something was found in horse meat that was actually extremely dangerous. The European horse meat scandal just really brought that to light and, um, you know, essentially was a mislabeling problem, but so much more, of course, came out and the, the uh, horror that people felt about it was really what took off the disgust that the European people felt about eating meat First of all, that was from a horse, and secondly, that could possibly have drug residue issues that could be a, a problem for public health. So there was tremendous negative publicity, which I really, if I was running a slaughterhouse, I would want to run as far away as possible from a racehorse, if I could, because this has resulted in increased scrutiny from the European Union, which may even, at some point, end up resulting in them not accepting racehorses in part of this, as part of the slaughter pipeline. So, for me, it's a bad relationship for the slaughterhouse to be involved with, at this juncture, thoroughbreds or and standard bred racehorses. But the racehorses are the most high-profile contributors to the slaughterhouse. So many of the publicity that happened, um, some was actually very clever, <laughs> but um, much of the publicity centered around what people most commonly think of with horses, and that's racing. So it was bad for racing. And it was bad for the slaughterhouses and for all those companies, as we've already heard today. They were funny, I have to say, some of them. <laughs> Very clever. So first, for the fallout from that scandal, first of all, it increased the public's awareness of equine slaughter. So this is the old strike when the iron is hot um, time for everyone in this room. It was not a positive for racing at all. Like I said, horses, uh, racehorses are the most high-profile horses sent to slaughter because they're easily traceable. They have identifications, and they have race records, and they have a paper trail of people that own them, and there was a lot of um, things that were embarrassing to people. I mean, in some cases, honest mistakes. They bred a horse, and ten owners later, it's in the slaughterhouse. You know, so that, that's a real problem. 
It also increased the public mistrust of the processed food industry and the government oversight that's looking out for it. Um, so like I said, it might lead to increased uh, European Union restrictions, which could lead to less demand for U.S. horses. That's already a concern. Horses do not have a passport system as they do in Europe, where which that does have some faults with it as well, but at least it's a system designed to uh, have a paper trail for the horse of any medications that's been given to it throughout its lifetime. We don't have that in the U.S. currently. Mm -hmm. So like I said, it's possible that racing breeds may be even excluded. So what's next for racing and slaughter? I wish I, I wish there was would be at least an official position that would be taken by the two most visible groups. That would be the NTRA and the Jockey Club. Um, racing is sort of a gypsy or fragmented type industry. We don't have a baseball commissioner, one governing body. So there's factions of people, and so it's been hard to get um, a consensus. But there have been a lot of independent entities that have emerged that have some pull and some power uh, that have tried to address this problem. That's the uh, anti-slaughter groups that have, have uh, anti-slaughter programs that have occurred at many of the racetracks, and actually New York has just started their aftercare program, Naira, and um, they're coupling with new vocations and some of the other rescue groups to try to get that moving. But that's a huge step in the right direction. Um, many of the ownership groups, there's there's actually a lot of thoroughbred ownership groups that um, provide aftercare. Frank Stronach is one of the most high-profile ones of Adina Springs, who started an aftercare program for all of his horses that he's ever bred, and developed a facility in Florida, actually, that where he would retrain any of his thoroughbreds that didn't make it, uh, take them back, and then provide um, training to get them sold as riding horses. So it was it was a huge thing for him to come out and do that, and some other groups have since followed. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's a lot of the rehoming and retraining rescue groups specific for racehorses that are actually being funded now by industry-wide groups. So it's it's all positive in that direction. Um, so we're getting there in that, that regard. So I have a wish list and world peace is probably on there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think about this a lot. I, I work with a lot of groups in my practice and you know some things are it's heartbreaking. I, I know you cannot save every horse, but I think every horse deserves another chance. Um, that's been my crusade, I guess. And um, so what I would really like to see in, in the racing industry is a very comprehensive industry-wide support of the aftercare program. And it's happening, but when it does happen all the way around, I'll, I'll be very happy. That would include registration fee requirement requirements. So when the horse is registered, there's a fee put right away for every horse that's that's foaled. A registration fee. It's really for all the money that is spent to develop a foal. I really can't see a hundred dollars or something like that really breaking somebody. Um, you know, thoroughbreds are bred for a reason. They're they're not backyard horses. So the people that breed them usually have some money to do so. Uh, so it's sort of like an equine social security program, something like that. Um, safety nets in place. Um, the U.S. Trotting Association does have a couple of programs that's worked out well. You can register every horse you've ever bred if you ever want to be contacted uh, if the horse needed some kind of safety net. Uh, that, you know, they're helping with that. And they also have an SOS fund for horses that are stuck somewhere that they, they, you know, they have fallen into a bad way that, that there's a fund set up by the industry to help those horses get out of there. This is big, I think, revisions to the claiming portion of the sport. The horse I showed you earlier in comparison to Smarty Jones that had won all that money and then was slaughtered, the sad part is what happens in racing is horses can start out with one owner and do very well and then naturally they're athletes and they age and they get injuries and wear and tear so they lose begin to lose their value and they get dropped into a claiming race. Then it just goes from there and I think the only the only thing that loses there is the horse. In the end the horse loses all the time because they're just dropped from glory days where they're treated fabulously and sometimes end up at some very bad places for very little money. They're not worth it to that person. Didn't make six hundred thousand dollars for that person that's running it for twenty five hundred dollar tag. 
So I, I really would like some revision in the claiming race, um, the way it's set up. You know, in Europe it's a little bit different. Horses are, actually can be inspected before they're claimed, which leads to less likelihood of someone running a horse that's not fit or injured. Um, so there's some things there I would really like to see that would, I think, in the end, help the welfare of the horses. I also think that every time a horse is claimed, there should be a fee attached to it. The claiming horses make up the bread and butter of the racing industry. If you charged the person that claimed a horse for $20,000, he was charged $100, great. Put that in a fund. Sometimes those horses are claimed 20 times. They're the ones that always lose. The claim, claiming horses are the ones that end up in these places. I'd like to see um, some educational programs for the people in our industry. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for these horses for, op for after racing. I, I see it every day, but you have to get them before they're so far gone that, that they're, they're not useful. So it would be really a good thing, I think, to have some kind of educational program in place where you can <coughs> educate trainers to say, you know, this is what happens when this knee is getting this arthritic. You're going to break it, you know, the next start, or you're getting close to that point. If you stop now, the horse can rest and have a chance to be something else. You know, just, just a simple thing like that, I think, would go a long way in helping the horse. It's the one too many syndrome, which I, I see too many times. Uh, euthanasia options. It's funny that 10 to 12 percent of the equine population dies or is euthanized every year. I think there's close to 9 million horses, something like along those lines in the U.S., 9 million horses. So 10 to 12 percent die anyway, yet slaughter contributes 1 or 2 percent of that mm -hmm. amount, 1 or 2 percent of 9 million. Yet the, the argument sometimes that you hear is why we can't uh, get rid of slaughter is because what are we going to do with all these horses? Mm -hmm. Well. I have no problem euthanizing a horse that is unwanted, has no purpose, or is injured, whatever. Why can't we take care of this? Why can't we approach this problem? The Unwanted Horse Coalition is a very good group. It's come up with some great ideas. But one thing that they have that's a real head-scratcher for me is this Operation Gelding, where they will contribute financially for people who can't afford it to have their horse gelded. It almost makes me laugh because the horses are not running loose in the streets like dogs and cats and breeding. breeding. <laughs> that is not the problem. It's people. That's an education issue, which they've done a lot for, and an education. But I, I mean, it's, if you can't afford to geld your horse, you really can't afford a horse. But really, the real issue is why not have euthanasia clinics, a place that people can go and have their horses nice, a nice setting, a peaceful death. That's part of my responsibility to, to, to provide a, a, an end for horses. I, I, I don't see the difference between you think I was a horse and throwing it on a truck somewhere. It's still going to end up dead. Why not do it the right way? I just, you know, I just don't understand why we can't throw trucks. That's, that's one of my biggest wishes, although it's a horrible thing to say, but we need to have a euthanasia policy that's successful for people, that's um, reasonable. You know? And this, I guess just in closing, I just would you know, thank you for having me, and that I do recognize that this is a, a multifactorial problem, and it's nice that we're all in this room and have the same focus, that we care about these horses and we care about the industries that we're attached to and that we want to see uh, something better happen. Um, I realized a long time ago that the political process is, is a tough game. And so for me, you know, I, I just try to do my little part. If I can fix a horse and it can go on and have another career, that's great. I'm, I'm happy to do it. It's it may be a small dent that I'm making in the problem, but it's still a dent. So mm -hmm. that's all I can ask for at this this time. But having all of you here really gives me hope that we'll make some progress. So. Thank you.